First of all, we would like to introduce four recent topics related to AI, robots, and peripheral technologies. First, please welcome Professor Rodney Allen Brooks, Panasonic Professor of Robotics Emeritus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Brooks is AI robots pioneer. He proposed subsumption architecture in 1986. This subsumption has been widely influential in autonomous robotics and elsewhere in real-time AI. In addition, he established AI robot company and the room cleaning robot Roomba was developed and sold. He will give a talk on AI and robotics, how each will help the other. Please welcome Professor Brooks. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and I thank uh, Professor Fukuda for uh, inviting me. I also noticed that he said I was the inventor of the, the Roomba. I remember 45 years ago, I got my degree in pure mathematics, which was very high-level thinking. <laughs> now, 45 years later, I'm a vacuum cleaner salesman. <laughs> uh, so. These long-term goals sometimes change. It's always good to remember that in terms of the moonshot. Um, I'm going to give a talk today, which uh, has, uh, oh, I can see my slides here. This will be helpful. Um, uh, the seven parts of, of unequal length, um, uh, sort of a setting for uh, what moonshots might be. And I'm going to talk a little about my own biases on how one should specify a moonshot. And that's the, the last. Uh, three parts of this talk. But first, let me start with the state of AI and robotics. And uh, I, this is from the Wikipedia uh, history of AI page. Um, and you can see that you know, some people today in AI, some young researchers think that AI was just invented five years ago. It's been around for over 60 years. Uh, and it has a long history. Um, but I want you to notice one thing, that neural networks have come and gone four times uh, in, in AI. This is the one that the press knows about today, deep learning. This is uh, many AI companies who are adopting AI only know about this thing that happened recently. But even this one has a long history. And that's important, I think, to remember as we talk about moonshot goals, that many old ideas may come back and may be very useful. So we have to think broadly about what's available. Um, oh, and this... Uh, this is my own uh, 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 sort of approach that was re uh, introduced in the 1980s, uh, the embodied AI, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, today. But mostly I'm going to talk about the bigger picture. Now, while we've had that long history, the reality uh, that we've had from science fiction hasn't turned out. Uh, Astro Boy in Japan, uh, uh, what was Rosie, Rosie the Robot in, in the American uh, cartoons, uh, we don't have systems as good as, as what we had expected uh, from, from uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, I want to plot what sort of real robots have been deployed. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about lab demos here. I'm going to talk about things that are actually out there deployed in the world. And in this chart, I'm going to look at structured environments versus unstructured environments. Instruction environments, humans have built, changed the world for the robots ahead of time. In unstructured environments, it is the world as the robots encounter. Um, and then I want to talk about the difference between human determined actions and AI synthesized actions. And here I'm going to include teleoperation and pre programming. We'll see both. So in this case, the human is making the decision at runtime. In this time, the human is making the decision beforehand. And can contrast that with um, reactive and reasoned AI systems, where the, the decision is made at, at runtime by the robot. And so we're comparing you know, a brain-like brain -like system to an AI system. So first, uh, industrial robots. And this is what industrial robots in the real world deployed look like. This is a, a, a building uh, automobile bodies. Um, and these robots are going through the same sequence of actions again and again with very little sensing. They're not sensing where to grab the, where to do the world. They're going to a particular position, 
and the world has been structured so that the right piece of metals are right where the robot goes to. There's no sensing that's going on there. Um, and in real deployments of robots, uh, it's all robots and no people. Uh, we often talk about cages around robots. In this case, the cages are for people to come into to be safe from the robots. So industrial robots are down here. Structured environment, pre-programmed, that's where industrial robots largely are. The vast majority of industrial robots uh, are like this and have been uh, since the early 1960s. Uh, I've worked for many years on uh, uh, cobots, uh, a new class of robots uh, in a company called Rethink Robotics, which uh, recently got bought by a German organization and they've changed the color of the robots from red to black. I think red was much better, but <laughs> that's their choice. Um, and these robots were, were programmed in um, behavior trees, but the behavior trees were automatically written, and the software system is still out there, automatically written by the, an AI system, very simply. So this is the Intera programming system. You grab the robot, you show it what to do, um, and it infers the fingers closed, they felt something, that means it must have been a pick. And here, the fingers open, something goes away, that must have been a place, and the AI system automatically builds something called a behavior tree, which I'll talk about a bit later, um, with uh, pieces, pick and place, with some default parameters set in. Uh, you can go in and change those, but many of the parameters are inferred by the system. Uh, in order to do this task. Here you see it executing and the green elements are where it is in the behavior tree. Um, so it, it tries to get contextual information. A human can review this tree that was automatically generated, edit things in it, change things in it. So it's a mixture of teach by demonstration and the human editing the program. And this is pretty much state of the art for industrial robots today. Um, uh, it means that simple things can be done simply. Many uh, technicians don't even look at the behavior tree, but if, if they want to, they can go in and make much more complex things. And this particular behavior, uh, particular software system works on many, many different sorts of industrial robots. I won't go through it. Well, let's just go a little bit longer. Here he's picking out a, a pattern of pieces and how it should be uh, done. But we also use force control, impedance mode, and uh, so you can specify forces, where things are uh, fixed, where things are free. And um, again, this is uh, uh, applicable to many different sorts of robots. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead there and just say that the AI intelligence of this system uh, for training by demonstration, but humans get to review how this automatically written program uh, performs before deployment in factories. So again, there's a little bit of, a little less structured environment is allowed because it can sense with cameras, it can sense with force. It's a little more runtime decision, but humans are still quite involved in programming these robots. Not necessarily by writing code, but by showing it what to do. Now in recent years, there's been a, a, a revolution in fulfillment centers. This is the original Kiva robot systems, which became Amazon. Alibaba have very similar ones. The company in India, Gray Orange, has very similar ones. And here the idea is that these little orange robots go and pick up the shelves and bring them to a human who's gonna take things out of the shelves and pack them away to be sent out to customers. So um, the robots, instead of a person going to the shelf and picking something up, the robots bring things to the human. Um, it looks very unstructured, but in fact, from the robot's point of view, this is a very structured environment. All the shelves are lined up precisely in X, Y coordinates. The robots just have to go under them. Everything is in a very simple grid. The robots don't know anything about the complexity of what's in the packages. So these sorts of uh, fulfillment systems are a very structured environment, but a lot more runtime decision making, optimizing, deciding where to put the shelves based on frequency of use, et cetera. Now, we all know about autonomous cars. 
the promise of autonomous cars. We'll talk more about the deployment later. So I'm including these, although they're not really deployed yet. Um, there's one place where actual cars are used without a, a human driver. Uh, that's in uh, Chandler, Arizona. But there are only 400 people pre-approved to use the system. Uh, and, and if anyone has been to Chandler, Arizona, I think you may have, uh, very wide roads, almost no traffic, very simple, uh, very simple environment. Even there, even there, things not so good. I was in Mumbai last week, uh, not like Chandler, Arizona. Okay, so these are not quite really deployed yet. They're in somewhat structured environments of simple cities. The question is how far can they be pushed to the right? We don't know yet on what time scale. I'll talk about this more later. Uh, uh, robots uh, uh, for roadside bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is the PACBOT. There were 6,500 of them uh, that my company deployed uh, to, to deal with uh, uh, bombs, etc. Then uh, in, uh, when Fukushima happened, uh, we got some robots there. Seven days after it happened and they were involved in going and uh, this, this is a picture from inside Fukushima in a high radiation environment. You know, pairs of the robots going in, setting up Wi-Fi hotspots. But it allowed teleoperation to go and look at what was happening out in the damaged reactors and help with the shutdown. So these sorts of robots uh, work in unstructured environment, but they're completely controlled by humans. Just a few simple AI techniques to, to make a, a couple of things work better but very human operated. Mars rover, this was the first one, uh, July 4th, 1997. This came out of a project that I had started at, at, at JPL, the Sojourner. And Sojourner, for the first seven Martian days, was a primary mission, completely underground control. The next 21 Martian days was a secondary mission, that was again under ground control. And after 28 days, they'd had the, this first and second, primary and secondary mission, so then they let it, let it run under our behavior control system. And it wandered around until, this is day 72, it's off in the distance, operating autonomously. Uh, it, it died around day 84. Has anyone here seen the movie The Martian? Must have seen The Martian. Must be more people saw the movie The Martian. It's a great movie. So in the, in, in, the, in the movie The Martian, the, the, the astronaut goes and digs up uh, Sojourner from under the sand. It made me very happy. But the Mars rovers, over time, have gotten bigger. Um, this is the first one. This is, there are two of these. Uh, and this is the current one that's running. Oh, actually, one of these two is still running. And this one is running on Mars. Um, over time, they've gone from very much ground control as the missions have extended much, much longer than expected. This, this had a mission of 90 days. It's still operating over 10 years later, maybe 14 years now, I'm not sure. This one is about seven or eight years in. Again, a primary mission of only about 90 days. So over time, uh, people on Earth got tired of controlling everything. They've uploaded more software, and they've become more autonomous over time um, after their primary missions and secondary missions. I'll come back to that in a second. So here we have these rovers, which are in unstructured environments. They started out as being fairly human controlled. They got more autonomous after being deployed over time. I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm sorry, the Roomba. Um, 30 million of the Roombas have been deployed worldwide. Tens of millions of other uh, uh, similar sorts of robots have been deployed for cleaning homes, although when humans are involved, they do weird things. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't really work very well on the grass. And this is really a bad idea. <laughs> so the Roomba, very unstructured environment, makes all its decisions itself. So it's up there on the top right-hand corner. So I talked about behavior trees for robots Behavior Trees, which is based on my, my work from um, 1985 and 2000, the year 2000, uh, a, a student at the MIT Media Lab came up with Behavior Trees, and they have become the dominant way that video games are now produced. 
So two-thirds of all video games are now written either with the Unity uh, platform with behavior trees or with the um, Unreal platform with uh, behavior trees. So this is how two-thirds of all video games are now programmed. Are they robots? Well, they're sort of fake robots in the graphics world. There's more of them than any other sort of robot. But they're in reasonably structured environments, but they make runtime decisions up there. Um, up there. So the cars are not yet really deployed. All these other systems are deployed. Um, and in practice, for robots, AI and, auto and autonomy is only trusted when the consequences for failure are very low. So consequences of failure here are high, no AI. Um, primary and secondary mission consequences of failure are very high. Only when the robots already achieved everything that was expected of it have NASA allowed them to be autonomous or have any sorts of autonomy. Uh, the Roomba up there, consequence of failure is very, very low. It doesn't matter if the robot gets stuck. Uh, you know, the worst failure is when people have dogs in the house, the dogs poop on the floor, the robot <laughs> spreads the poop everywhere. <laughs> That's a bad consequence, but very rare. But mostly, a, 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 sorry, mostly a failure, a failure, um, a failure of the Roomba doesn't matter. These guys, failures have high consequence. They're not really deployed yet uh, in autonomy. Um, these guys uh, are in very structured environments and don't make many decisions. Um, I've been involved in, in all of these pieces. So I have, I have a very different view than many academics. I don't think that problems are solved when a lab demonstration happens. I think problems are solved when you get major scale deployment. Lab demonstrations are important, but that's not necessarily solving the problem. And, and this, is, uh, this is, I'm gonna call this Brooks Law. <laughs> Deploying robots to do real work involves three orders of magnitude more human effort than a lab demo. That's been my experience. A lab demo, you know, and I've, I've run labs, I've had students produce demos, I've done great demos, but to turn them into a real product that real users can use that actually just work when it comes out of the box is, in my view, three orders of magnitude more work. But if you actually want to be a commercial success, it's four orders of magnitude more work because there's another 10 times as much effort on sales, marketing, channel, et cetera. So it's a lot of work. So I think this is a question for the moonshot. Is it lab demos or is it working systems? That's, that's a question on what time scale? Real world demo or actual out of the box experience? That's my vacuum cleaner salesman. Out of the box experience. That's what we call it. Okay. AI, if you read uh, stories in the press, videos, uh, podcasts, AI is here, AI is fantastic, AI can do everything. Eh, not really true. Now why is that? Why, why, what's, the, what's the disconnect? Well, I, I uh, wrote a blog post which then I had a version of in um, MIT Technology Review magazine that I called the seven deadly sins of predicting the future of AI. And the, the, I give seven different ways people make mistakes, both researchers and the press and commentators about overestimating how well AI works. I'm gonna talk about three of those today, not all seven. Um, and I'm gonna start with performance versus competence. So in performance versus competence, this was the New York Times in November of 2014. This was in the US at least, when the public got introduced to deep learning. This is the first time people saw it. Where, and this was a photo that was in the New York Times with a caption generated by a Google program, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. And that's a pretty good label of that, that image. It's good, it's, it's appropriate. I think it was surprising to many AI researchers that this happened, it was a shock that they were able to do so well. 
Now, if I was giving this talk in Japanese instead of in English, you would probably think that you could ask me uh, in Japanese about the weather, and I'd be able to talk about the weather. If I could speak, if I could give this talk in Japanese, surely I would understand about weather. You would think I could talk about many topics, you know, about food in Japanese, about all sorts of things. So when we see someone with a performance, we know how to generalize what their general competence is. But it's not the same for these systems. So this system is able to say a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee, but it doesn't know what a Frisbee is. You, these are questions you could, if a person had said that label, you'd think you could ask them these sorts of questions. What's the shape of a Frisbee? How far can a person throw a Frisbee? Can a person eat a Frisbee? And if a, if a person had given that label, it would be weird if they couldn't answer these questions. It just doesn't make sense to us. How could they say, talk about Frisbee and, without knowing the shape of a Frisbee? Uh, how could they talk you know, without knowing that you can't eat it? Of course they know you can't eat it. But this system has no idea. These labeling systems have zero idea. So we make a mistake. The press makes a mistake. They see the performance of a narrow task and assume that the system has the general competence around it, which it doesn't. Here's a, this is now an old idea, but it started in 2015. Here's a deep learning network, which you know, says if this is a guitar, 99% of the time this is a penguin with 100% probability. And then they used a, a technique um, uh, from artificial life, uh, hill climbing in a genetic system, actually using a, uh, a representation that came from Carl Sims. Some of you may have known his work in the 90s. And generated fake images, which this system also labeled. This is a guitar. This is a penguin. For a human, they're not guitars or penguins, but it found that inside the weights, it could fool it. And, you know, this is a baseball. This is a matchstick. We can see they're not. We can see the essence of why this might be a baseball, the essence of why this might be a matchstick. But we don't make those same sorts of mistakes. So the systems are fragile. These are called adversarial uh, attacks. Here's some just examples that were not adversarial. These are real examples the system thinking this is a snow plow with 92% probability. We can all see that that's, a, that's a, a, a school bus on its side with a person standing in front of it. But why does the system fold? Well, it's, it's yellow, and snow plows in the United States are all yellow. There's snow around. It's sort of the light right aspect ratio. But we would not make that mistake. So that's where people overgeneralize. They also overgeneralize because of what Marvin Minsky called suitcase words. And in English, uh, you know, these are English words that are often applied to AI systems that they can do certain things, but they have bigger meanings than their application. So I'm going to use the English word learn. And people get very excited about AI systems learning. In my last company, the one with the industrial robots, that I started in 2008, around 2011, one of my venture capitalists called me and said, does your system learn? Someone else's system learns. Your system has to learn. Uh, it was, but learn is a big, big word. It has many meanings in English. Uh, we learn to play tennis. But that's a different experience from learning to ride a bike. It's another thing you learn in English. It's a very different experience from learning ancient Latin. Um, taught the blackboard, etc. The other one's physical. It's a very different experience from learning algebra. I, I was really good at algebra. I was really bad at Latin. Uh, so learning in one domain is not learning in another domain. Learning to play chess. Learning to play a musical instrument. I was really bad at that. I was terrible at that. Good at algebra. <laughs> and learning your way around a new city. All uh, learning to code. All these words used all in English, learn, means all these things, which are very different, different capabilities. So when people, or the press, hears that a robot learns some task, they sort of generalize to learning everything. And all those words, those suitcase words, overgeneralize. 
speed of deployment. Um, many academics think that when they have done the lab demo, that problem is solved. And it is solved in terms of being interesting for an academic reason, means. But for actual deployment at a large scale, it takes a lot longer. For instance, self-driving cars and trucks are robots, and the press has been saying they're going to take away all the truck driving jobs, they're going to take away all sorts of jobs, but they're not really deployed. Um, and that's because deploying robots is not a one-for-one -one substitution. People thought, okay, a self-driving car, we'll just substitute that for existing cars. But if we look at history, that didn't happen. Let's look at horse-drawn carriages to automobiles. This was the first, um, the first ad, dispense with a horse, uh, with this motor carriage, get rid of the horse. Now, to start off with, the horseless carriages looked a lot like a carriage that had a horse. People sat out, uh, outside. Over time, um, it started to change a little bit, and eventually only the driver had to sit outside, and the people could sit inside. Uh, eventually, the driver got to sit inside, too. So there was a change. Um, then we had to change the roads. This was New York City before automobiles. People and horses all along the road. We had to partition where people could walk, where the cars could be, which we didn't have to do with horse-drawn carriages. Um, I had to change the structure of the roads. They had to be much more stronger. Eventually, we got things like this, or here in Japan, and some of you have often probably driven through this interchange. Now, this made no sense. You know, imagine if you were riding a horse and you got to this. It makes no sense. It's a totally different structure needed for the new technology. So as we develop new technologies, we have to change more than just the technology. We have to change the infrastructure often. It's not a one-for-one -one substitution. So self-driving automobiles, oh, here's a test. Now, the real robotics people are not allowed to answer this. Um, but other people have to answer. When did a self-driving vehicle first travel 20 kilometers at 90 kilometers per hour down a public freeway? Someone who's not, uh, not a roboticist, when, when, did the, when do you think that happened? First time, which year? What's your guess? Someone? This year? Oh, sorry? This year? this year? Yeah, no. It was 1987 near Munich, Ernst Dickmann's. Um, 1987 is when the first driverless car drove down a freeway at 90 kilometers an hour. That's 32 years ago. So people think, oh, it's happening now, so it'll be deployed next year. It happened 32 years ago, it's still not deployed. Okay, when do you think, and you can't answer, you guys, when do you think the first hands-off steering wheel, feet-off pedals, vehicle will drive coast to coast across the US? When do you think that will, will happen? Someone guess. OK. When do you think it might happen? Oh, he knows. <laughs> yes. It was 1995 with Chuck Thorpe and Takeo Kanade at, uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Coast to coast without human driving. Again, this is 24 years ago. We still don't have it deployed. It takes a long time to get to deployment. So people today think, oh, it's, it's instantaneous. These are the levels of automation. These are the ones that are being deployed now, driver assistant, partial automation, but high automation, level four. Here's, I, I collected this set of predictions in March 2017, and these were dates. Um, the ones in blue are, um, these blue ones are when the prediction, when it was predicted this would happen, level four enabling system from NVIDIA. In 2017, they said it would happen next year, level four, which m means driver is not driving at all. So I, c I collected these on March 27, 2017, uh, these, these predictions. These ones, the date has already passed. None of them happened, none of them. These orange ones are ones where the car companies have revised their predictions. So Nissan in 2013 said fully autonomous vehicles by 2020. They don't say that anymore. Uh, <laughs> BMW doesn't say it anymore. 
Ford has changed the answer twice. Uh, Volkswagen, uh, you know, um, they've, they've all said, and I think uh, um, uh, uh, Daimler has said they're not going to anymore, right? They've said, no, we're not doing it. Um, so, oh yeah, here's, here's, here's Daimler. 2014, predicted by 2025, now Daimler says, mm, no, we're just not doing it. Um, so, expectations, easy, reality, hard. Um, as I said, you know, um, Chandler, Arizona, they had safety drivers. The press said, you know, it's now uh, deployed, but there were safety drivers. Just very recently, they got rid of the safety drivers. And ha now here's a, an ironic fact. In San Francisco, when you call an Uber, sometimes you get a driverless Uber, self-driving Uber. But you know it's self-driving because there are two people in the front seat to check it. When you get a regular Uber, there's one person in the front seat. So this is an employment opportunity. Twice as many people for a driverless car as a driver car. Um, uh, I don't think we'll ever get to one-to-one -to -one replacement driverless cars for, for driver full cars. And we see that with trains. Um, all self-driving trains are geofenced. Here in, in Tokyo, we have the... Uh, Yurikamome line uh, uh, goes out to uh, Odaiba. Um, if you go there, you'll see there's double glass doors so people can't get onto the tracks. The tracks are very carefully built so that people can't climb onto the tracks because having a, a person on the tracks would be disastrous for these driverless trains. For If you look around Tokyo, for trains that had drivers, the tracks are not as well protected. People could climb up there, but they're not as well protected. And this is, you know, up above so people can't climb, etc. So um, we're going to have to refactor our road infrastructure before we get driverless chain, trains. So again, as we have a moonshot and we want the technology, how that technology gets deployed may be a much harder question. Um, and while people have been very worried about uh, driverless train or driverless cars and trucks taking away jobs in the US, Walmart is hiring as many drivers as they can. Um, so. so some things have been hard for AI for 60 plus years. Um, uh, these are some of them. I'm going to talk about the first three, real perception, real manipulation, and reading a book. What do I mean by real perception? We already talked about how fake images can fool deep learning. But here's a, uh, this is a, from a US Senate hearing last year. Here's a senator talking about deep learning and its failure. So here, the stop sign, someone put some pieces of tape on it, white and black tape, and the driverless car perception system recognized this as a speed limit 45 sign. That's a bad mistake between stop and speed limit 45. Now, people see this and they say to me, how can that be? Everyone knows a stop sign's red, a speed limit sign is white. How could it make that mistake? It comes from a certain way of thinking and hubris about how good deep learning might be. So what we had was, in the old days for machine learning, we had a human deciding on features that would be extracted and then a small network learning whether something was a car or not a car. More recently, we got rid of the feature extraction and had that learnt too in these deep networks. It's very successful. That's why we can now have good speech-to-text systems. That's why Alexa from, from uh, uh, Amazon works. That's why Google at Home works. You can speak to them. They can understand you. They can understand many accents. But they give up on something that may not be in the training set. So what is this a picture of? Hashimoto Sensei. What is that a picture of? What do you mean? Chessboard. Oh, chess, chessboard. Chessboard. Why, why is there a chessboard? I know it. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, people say this is this is a chessboard because it's alternating black and white um, uh, squares. But notice there's a shadow here. Now, if we look at those two squares, one white and one black. They're actually the same intensity. And I'll show you that by zeroing out things around them. 
So they're part of the white square and the black square. They're the same intensity. But our perception system realizes they're white and black because our perception system compensates for that shadow and figures it out. Likewise, so they're the two, there's pixels from those two squares, exactly the same intensity. If the deep learning network is not trained to understand shadows, which no one has data sets for, it doesn't figure that out. It's worse in color. What, uh, what, what are these? What? Strawberries. What color are they? Red. Yeah, they're red, aren't they? <laughs> I, I, I got this from a, a, a Japanese psychologist. OK, there are almost 3 quarters of a million pixel. And there's only 122 where red is bigger than both green and blue of all those pixels. Here are the three pixels with the highest red when red is bigger than green and red is bigger than blue. Hmm, doesn't look very red, do they? They're the reddest pixels there. Here's the three pixels with the biggest R. Um, in each case, blue is the second biggest component. And if you get rid of that distractor, they're not red at all. Why are they, why are they red? Why do we see them as red? Because our brain figures out from the shape that it's strawberries, from all these little things, and then we know strawberries are red. So then we compensate for there being a blue light cast on this, and we extract that out. That's called color constancy. Humans are great at color constancy. The reason that the deep learning network didn't learn that stop signs are red is because the pixels aren't red in images. They appear red to us, but in different lighting, there's not much redness there, but we compensate and are able to get the exact color because we understand lighting. We have multiple processes going on. They're much more complex than we are, these perceptual systems. So now I'm going to uh, play a game. We're going to learn a new concept today from three examples. Now you can only play the game if you don't know this concept already. Who knows this concept? OK, you can't play. Who doesn't know this concept? Everyone else have, should put up their hand. If you don't know the concept, you're allowed to play, OK? So we're going to use three examples. I'm not going to tell you the category. Steampunk. Here's example one of steampunk. Take a look at steampunk, OK? Example two of steampunk. Example three of steampunk. Three examples. Now we're going to have a test. You all have to answer. OK? Is this steampunk? No. People say, no, that's not steampunk. Is this steampunk? Yes. It's very confident categorization after three. The deep learning systems usually have a million examples and are shown 100,000 times each. They showed you three examples once each. I think you may be better than deep learning networks. <laughs> Is this steampunk? No. OK. Not steampunk. Is that steampunk? Yes. Is that steampunk? Is that steampunk? I think it's a bad try at steampunk. <laughs> it's a bad try. And it, you even got the people saying, no, yes. And, and that, it's, a, it's, it's a bad try. Is that steampunk? Steampunk? Yes. Now look at this. He doesn't have any goggles. It's all about his arm. The three examples you had were all about goggles, no artificial arms, but you still got it right. You are able to generalize in your heads from three examples. Um, so steampunk is something that happens in the US at, at uh, uh, make affairs. So all those other pictures I showed where people had funny things in front of their eyes, they were at make affairs, but they weren't steampunk. So this is, you know, I guess, the US version of cosplay from Tokyo, from uh, Shibuya. Different, different version. So the, the point there is that, is that humans learn from a very no, small number of examples. They don't consume megawatts of energy in, 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 you know, in the cloud with, with the GPUs. It's much faster than deep learning. It's a very different experience. So we don't have real perception yet. We don't have real manipulation. This is a picture from 1979, and there's something there called the blue arm. Off to the side is something called the gold arm. How do I know that? Well, that's me. In 1979. So this is the gold arm. If you go to Stanford Computer Science Department, you can see it in the lobby. And here's the robot hand. It's a, called a parallel jaw gripper. 
with two fingers sliding back and forth. That's 1979. This is what my company, Rethink Robotics, was selling last year, and the German version of it is now selling. It's the same thing. It hasn't changed in 40 years. It's a parallel jaw gripper uh, back and forth. And this is what is deployed in the real world. Um, if you, this, this is a German company, Schunk, uh, with, has thousands and thousands of grippers. They're mostly parallel jaw grippers. Things haven't changed in manipulation. Now compare that to human manipulation. You have a little sound here. Now maybe we don't want to get robots to do that. That's pretty amazing. other tasks that we do want um, people to do. So here's slicing, and, and look at how humans, we, we have, don't have a robot that can do anything like this. Um, this is from uh, Julia Childs, a famous uh, uh, American chef. Here's, here's slicing raw fish, and it's not just moving the blade, it's feeling the texture, rotating the blade. It's a very skillful job. That sort of manipulation, that's pulling the skin off, we can't do anything remotely like this. We can sometimes do that. That's what we can do with robots. We don't do real manipulation. And in terms of deployed. Lab demonstrations, yes, not in terms of deployed. Here's someone in a factory um, you know, using uh, leather, which is a floppy material, and just being able to, to uh, pick it up, manipulate it. Very little work out there, as even in the labs of working with floppy material, none deployed in the real world. There's some force feedback. I'm going to skip over that. People are working on these problems in labs. This is one from Japan. Um, but the, the, this vast majority of workers who are doing these very skillful, dexterous things around the world, we can't hope to do anything like in unstructured environments. Another thing that um, people think, uh, you know, sometimes we see the press say that uh, uh, certain programs are reading books or taking exams. Uh, a lot of human knowledge can be found in books, so it would be great if our robots could just read them or, or watch videos. And every, every, every few months there's a, a, a news story saying that something can beat, a, beat a, uh, a human at reading books through some sorts of test. I think there was a, a Jap Japanese uh, entrance exam, uh, I think, for high school there was a, 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 an example of. But, but none of these are, are real. And i just show you a couple of examples why reading books is so hard. This is in English, I'm sorry, but the delivery truck zoomed by the school bus because it was going so fast. What does it refer to? Well, the delivery truck zoomed by the school bus because it was going so fast. The delivery truck was going faster than the school bus. But if we change one word, because it was going so slow, now it refers to the school bus. <laughs> Sam pulled up a chair to the piano, but it was broken, so he had to stand instead. It refers to the chair. If we change, so he had to sing instead. It refers to the piano. So in, do, in, in, in figuring that out, you're making a mental model of what happened, of Sam, piano, that plays music, singing is a substitute, you know a lot of stuff. And everything that gets written assumes all sorts of background knowledge. Here's some, you know, just some weird facts that, that anyone who writes a book knows these things. You know, we all know dolphins eat raw fish, so do some humans. Dolphins don't eat, usually eat cooked food, most humans do. So when people write a book, they don't say that explicitly, that's just background knowledge. But we have a vast amount of background knowledge and none of these AI systems do. It's called common sense. John McCarthy started working on it in 1958. Um, DARPA just started a new program on common sense in the US. Uh, and it's talking about objects, agents, places, number, geometry, social world. Here's some of the charts on it. Now when you see a chart like this, you think, oh, this is when they're gonna work on a particular task. No, in fact, in this case, this is when children develop those capabilities as young children. So DARPA is trying to emulate young children, and this is all from child psychology. Uh, a hard problem, it's been around for 60 years, unsolved. Okay, so now I'm gonna get to robotics and AI. 
most existing AI applications produce things for humans. So on the left, we have AI systems where humans tweak results or resubmit. For search engines, when we do a search on Google, we get a list of, of, of hits. Um, if we don't like those hits, we change the tech, we change the search words to try to get different, and we sort of adapt. And we scan them, and maybe the fifth one is the right answer. So we, we filter out bad answers. When we use speech to text, you know, for, for writing uh, Word documents, we edit the speech to text. We fix its mistakes. Um, we try to say, talk more clearly when we talk to a speech to text system. We try again when it misunderstood the semantics and say things a different way. For language translation, we sort of use our knowledge to understand the language translation because often it's terrible. Um, it's very hard to, to understand the automatic translations. It's useful because we as humans interpret the results, but it's our intelligence that's doing a big part of the work. So we can't do all these things automatically in AI. And in future collaborations between people and AI systems, the humans will do a lot of the common sense reasoning because the AI systems have none of the common sense. The humans will take care of the special difficult cases and the humans will offload the easy tasks to the robots. So we think AI systems are doing well, but it's the people who are doing the grounding of the symbols of the words to reality. And it may all be sort of a cheap trick. It's the humans that are doing the interpretation often in these systems. And we think AI is doing so well. Now, if instead we build robots that have to succeed without human intervention, then we can't trick ourselves. So if the robot has to go do something out there in the world by itself and humans aren't involved, it really has to be smart. The robots will either succeed or fail. The human won't get to be in the loop. By the way, you know, the only intelligent systems we know about us, or maybe great apes, if we look at evolution from the formation of the Earth, life came around here, multicellular life was billions of years later, and then only recently have we got the capabilities of great apes, humans, agriculture, writing, all in the blink of an eye. So I've always thought that all that stuff that we think AI should do must be the easy part, because it happened really quickly after a lot of evolution searching for other stuff. Um, Marvin Minsky again was very disappointed when he tried to build robots. It turned out to be really hard to do the sorts of... Uh, uh, everyday problems were much more complicated than the sorts of problems, puzzles and games adults consider hard. A lot of AI is still about games. All the headlines we see from DeepMind in London are about games, very different from working in the real world. So robots are important to force AI to be real. Um, so moving around the world, doing some tasks for real is the hardest part of intelligence. I think the smart stuff is just a thin layer on top of that. Um, the Turing test. Uh, I think I might skip this. Um, Turing test was, well, Turing test is, you know, people, the press uses the Turing test about the imitation game of whether a person first could determine whether someone was a man or a woman by asking them questions, and then this became, can a person can figure out whether something is a um, person or a computer by asking it questions. And if you look at the, the uh, if you look at what happens in, in, the, in these Turing tests with the press, um, it's become a media farce. So, this, why is this important to moonshots? We don't want to have a test for whether someone succeeded or not in the moonshot that becomes a media farce. So you have to be careful on how you determine success or failure. So this particular one was claimed to, a couple of years ago that a program had, uh, had beaten 10 judges out of 30 judges, but the judges were really stupid. <laughs> I mean, Eugene, the judge, I assure you I'm very calm, uh, says the judge. Don't even bother with me the fact that you are very calm. Anyone in AI knows that that was first put in by Weizenbaum in a 1964 program. This is not new stuff. So it's not about intelligence. So, naive human judges are not at all reliable. The moonshots are going to have to have some concrete way of determining success or failure. 
Um, I'm going to skip that. So what should moonshots have? This is, this is John F. Kennedy's moonshot. And this is, I'm going to be a bit on the extreme side here. The moonshot moonshot, I call this. Um, he said, the US should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. It was a very simple declaration. It did not, it said what was success. Send a man to the moon, return him. To surface of the moon, return him. A firm date by when it had to be achieved. There was no specification of what technologies had to be used, and there was no human judgment needed to decide whether it was achieved or not. Did the guy come back alive? It's a pretty simple test. Yeah, he's alive or he's dead. You know, no big, no big thing there. It was an easy test. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so Apollo, now notice, Apollo was a deployed system. It wasn't a lab demo. There were no graduate students up in orbit around the moon, you know, getting all the things switched on in sequence for the lunar module to land. Now, you know, your lab demos, the graduate students are there before the demo, they're getting everything just right. Then the visitor walks in, and now the demo works, right? There were no graduate students. It was deployed. It was a long way away, 400,000 kilometers away. No one to help. It worked. Um, so for the AI and robotics moonshots, here's some things that we may have to accept for this program. If there's room for human judgment in determining successful, of, successful failure, then the system will be gained. Well-meaning academics will overfit to get the result that the judges say worked. Um, People will use brute force methods to overfit to whatever the specified task is so that true intelligence will not be generated. We saw this happen in the DARPA, um, in the DARPA challenges for self-driving cars. At the last minute, they let people use GPS. People had been using GPS, they had it in their system, and then the ones that won relied on GPS, whereas a person driving get by without GPS. Teams may produce engineering solutions that involve very little of what we currently think of as AI. They may just build engineering systems uh, to, to just to make, make it achieve. And we may find victory to be very hollow. I think chatbots passing the Turing test is a very hollow victory for AI. It doesn't mean anything real. So we need to define moonshots very wisely. <laughs> Professor Fukada, <laughs> be wise. <laughs> now, now I'm going to just give one last thought, and then there's time for questions. This last thought is, we think we're so smart. We think we can build anything. We think we sort of know how to build intelligence with computation. You know, we've got to work it out. Are we really that smart? Perhaps we're just wrong. <laughs> this is what we sort of think of as intelligent robots, right? This is from the movie uh, iRobot. I, uh, I and the people with the, with the smart robot. That sort of looks like a human. The movie, those people built that robot. Suppose you're uh, at the beach and you see this, two dolphins. Dolphin A and Dolphin B. And then suppose you get up really close to Dolphin B, and it turns out to be a robot. Are you going to think, oh, this dolphin built that robot? No, a dolphin can't build a robot that's like itself. Well, can we build robots that are as good as ourselves? We like to think we are. Maybe this dolphin is arrogant too. Maybe it thinks it could but we're pretty sure it can't. Maybe we're just not smart enough. Who knows? We'll see. Thank you. And now I'll take questions. And I believe, I believe that you have to have a microphone for the question. So questions, please. Yes, question over here. Now it's on. 
Yeah. Well, thank you for this uh, fantastic talk. As always, <laughs> I remember a, uh, an M MIT professor called Rodney Brooks uh, saying that some people think AI is a complete failure, but it is around us every second of our day. Right? It is. It, it absolutely is. is. Yes. But this sounded like it's a complete disaster. No, 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 no. no, no. I'm sorry that I, I was I was reacting against the hype of how fantastic it is. Yeah. It's much more mundane. The AI that succeeds well, is mundane. McCarthy said. In fact, my friend here last night was uh, was was saying to me, I was really disappointed in the Roomba. It wasn't very smart. You know, it's got AI, but it's not smart AI, and he wasn't happy with that. Well, McCarthy said uh, when it works, it's not ca called AI anymore, yeah, right? Yeah. So maybe that's the, that's yeah. the essence of yeah. it. So, no, I, I, I think AI has been tremendously successful, but I think it's been tremendously overhyped, and people misjudge the level of capability that we're going to get. And if the, if the oh, uh, Fukuda's son is gone, if the, um, if the, if the moonshots you know, uh, that we're going to get a, a, a robot to win a Nobel Prize by 2050, I think totally impossible. It's not, not going to happen in that time frame because we're not close enough. But isn't it also a matter of expectation management? Right. That's so what I, that was yeah, what my talk exactly. was. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. Talk no, was no, expectation that's what I'm, management. I'm trying to echo it. Okay, right? yes. So, because, you know, I mean, what's 50 years? Sorry? What is 50 years of time? Yeah. It could be a, that we'll arrive there only in 150 years. So yes. what? Exactly. Exactly. But I think these are important questions for deciding on the moonshots. Yes, and um, someone's bringing a microphone. Yeah. Uh, again, oh, thank you also for an excellent talk. I wish I was one of your students. Um, but when I was at Stanford, I think I, I did a programming exercise on your golden arm before it was okay. golden, <laughs> quite a while ago. Um, you left us with a warning at the end, or caution at the end, that we should not be seeking hollow goals as a con, you know, as um, well, we, as we, an artifact of we our. We have to be shot. careful how we define what the goal is, so that we don't get a hollow solution. A hollow solution. Okay. So, what in your mind would be a non-hollow solution or non-hollow goal? What would be a substantive goal in this space? Well, okay, so I don't think this is the right goal, but well, let's go back to the perception. When the, um, when the uh, vision system for the car uh, says uh, that that's a 45 mile an hour sign limit, you should be able to have a discussion with it. No, that's white. Stop signs are always, uh, uh, sees, a, sees a stop sign and thinks it's a 45 mile an hour uh, speed limit sign. You should be able to have a discussion with it and say, no, that, that thing you're seeing is red. Speed limit signs are all white. And have it understand that and incorporate it into its model. That would be a non-hollow sort of system. That would be a, a reasoning system that you could communicate with. And just like we all learned steampunk in three examples, that sort of learning, which relies on a lot of human knowledge. So, And I realize that, you know, I may have a different level of expectation than the committee will. Yes, over, over there. Here comes the... Uh... Uh, thank you, Professor, for your talk. Uh, when you are, like, uh, like, I want to understand it, uh, like, when we comparing this AI and these things, and you are when saying, like, uh, Perhaps it cannot outperform the human. So are we are uh, making these uh, AI goals so wider, like it will uh, outperform each of the aspect of the human things, or it will be okay, like a few particular tasks which human use by her, his or her intelligence that can be replaced more efficiently by these things, like. Uh, specifically like this Nobel winning this, so some search of some molecule by some sort of learning and that type of uh, molecule uh, search or synthesis, uh, perhaps a, a chemistry professor or a PhD student take 10 to years and might be. Yeah, so, like, I, think, I think that's a good example. We give Nobel Prizes to people not because of the particular you know, that they discovered a particular molecule, but that the, they generated the science that led to the molecule. They, just did, they didn't just look at a table of numbers and come up with the, the molecule. They came up with models, and those models are more generally useful, so it has a big influence on science. So if we say, 
a robot has to win a Nobel Prize by 2025, it better be able to do all that stuff or it's not going to get the Nobel Prize. So I think the Nobel Prize winning robots are, are not a good idea. You know, in my, in my world, um, house cleaning robots were, was a, a capability. They're not better at cleaning houses than a human uh, professional cleaner. Uh, but most of the customers we sold to early on didn't clean their houses at all. So they were better than that. Now, three million uh, Roombas have been sold in Japan. I'm sure every Japanese house, the people clean their house. So there's some capability that's, that's more convenient. Um, but it's not better than a professional. Um, so I think we have to be careful what we aim for um, in terms of being achievable. And we're not going to be better than the best humans for a long, long time at just about any task. Now, we may be faster than the human at running. That's easy to do. That's what cars do. But um, intellectually, we're not going to beat humans for a long time. Yeah, like my concern is like, are we too harsh when we, like uh, this is also a, a one technology, like many technology from like brasses to automobiles and many things. So this particular AI is also a one technology. So are we overemphasizing on this technology to, if it will be like we call in terms of commercial or intellectually successful only when it beat human in all aspects or I don't think, even it beat in one no, aspect? I, I, I don't think the goals need to be beat a human. You know, we have an incredible labor shortage in Japan for construction. It doesn't have to be better than an expert construction worker, but able to substitute for a lot of the construction tasks will be very, very useful. But a human might be able to go into any one of those tasks and do it better than the robot. But it's useful enough that at a construction site, it's just safe to let, let that robot do it. The robot will do a, 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 a nice job of the construction, Won't invo may not involve a human ju you know, judgment. That's good enough. So I think that sort of moonshot goal is, is quite, quite a reasonable thing to go for. And even if we're not smart enough to build copies of ourselves, we may be smart enough to build a robot that can do construction. By the way, in today's construction industry, many of the techniques used for construction were invented by the Romans 2,000 years ago, and we still use those same techniques. Thank you. So uh, we would like to move to the next uh, invited talk. And uh, maybe uh, narration we, we have. So uh, please, uh, please introduce. I can introduce myself. OK. Um, please welcome. We, we have a narration. Sorry, but. Uh, please welcome. Uh, thank you. Please. Welcome, Professor Alois Knoll, Chair of Robotics, AI, and Embedded Systems of Technical University of Munich. Professor Alois Knoll has been working on autonomous robots since Bielefeld University. In Technical University of Munich, he is promoting the Human Brain Project as an EU Horizon 2020 principal investigator. He will give a talk on a European perspective on AI robotics and the flagship Human Brain Project. Please welcome Professor Knoll. Yeah, thank you very much. Toshi Fukuda Sensei, he's not here, but you know, <laughs> his spirit is in the room all the time. So he asked me to not only talk about the Human Brain Project, but also a little bit about the European perspective, which has become possible we, because we, we were, you know, invited to talk for 30 minutes, now we can talk 60 minutes, and I thought that might be a good opportunity to also talk a little bit about the European perspective. So. Let me uh, start by, I mean, maybe taking a little bit the opposite side of Rodney, right? So moonshots, what does it, you know, what is the association? Of course, the, the universe. And is there a more complex thing uh, in, the, um, in our world than the universe? Obviously not, with one exception. And that's, of course, the human brain. And I can only concur with Rodney when he says, well, maybe the brain is not enough to replicate the brain. Right. But maybe it is. We don't know. 
which is why we need these moonshot projects. And even in the universe where we have two, to the, two times 10 to the power of 12 galaxies, I mean, these are really large numbers, 10 to the 24 stars, right? Only now have we been able, using all the computational power that we have, so this is the latest, uh, the latest uh, publication by the illustrious group, MIT, HLRS, Max Planck Society. They are simulating this complex thing, this complex structure, the universe, um, and have come up with you know, very nice simulations. This is the formation of a galaxy, obviously, and it looks very nice, but nevertheless, right? I mean, is it really what happened? We don't know. We can only assume that we are close to this. Now, if we look at the, um, the brain, right, the numbers are even larger. And we will probably, if we want to simulate the brain or parts of the brain, we will need even more computational power, much more than we'll have at the moment. Nevertheless, this could be a very interesting route as we evolve into the age of exascale computers to at least try to simulate part of the part of the brain, and I'm quite cautious here. Right? I mean, this was actually for the Human Brain Project. This was the, uh, you know, the um, the hypothesis that uh, that um, Henry Markram came up with who was the spiritus rector behind that uh, project. And um, when he said that, and actually I'll come to the story or the history of the, the Human Brain Project in a couple of minutes, um, it came under extremely heavy fire, right? Probably not from Rodney. He didn't even take notice of the project. Oh, well, so then. So what did you say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Very polite. So, but he does, still doesn't believe in the project. But nevertheless, um, we have been, like I said, I mean, it was under heavy fire, and despite the fact that it was, a, it is a highly controversial project. Clearly, you know, I wouldn't know of any other which is as ambitious, or ambitiously going in that direction. Right. So, yeah, I come to that in a couple of moments, and. One thing that we should always be aware of is, you know, what we what we are dealing here with, right? If you look at the brain, is there a pointer? The green thing, yes, thank you. Oh, well, well, that's the red. This is the red one, right? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, so we deal with spatial scales from one meter down to the nanometer, right? And obviously, if you really want to uh, simulate the brain with some physical realism, then you have to deal with all these dimensions. Same for time scales, right? From years or even thousands and ten thousands of years, Rodney just showed the, you know, the, the, the time scales down to, for the evolution, down to picoseconds, 10 to the minus 12. And energies. So if you look at the complex brain model on one of the computers we have, it takes a joule to perform one logical operation, but um, in the brain, it's only one femtojoule, 10 to the minus 14. So that's, um, that's or 10 femtojoules, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 15. Um, so that's the, the scales, and that's the, you know, the breadth and spread that we're dealing with. Okay, so I come to that, but before, I uh, come back to that, but before that, I'd like to, uh, to introduce the, um, the um, European perspective, and there are some interesting numbers, also large numbers. Here you can see the, uh, you know, the GDP of the, uh, the EU. Actually, this is, I think it was shown yesterday in a similar, a similar graph. Uh, this is in US dollars. If you use US dollars and, and constant value since 2010, the picture looks totally different, right? But what, what, there's one constant, Japan is relatively constant, and of one invariant, Japan is very constant, and China is exponentially growing. I mean, that doesn't, is nothing new. But what you may not have known, or what you may not be aware of, is that if you take the market capitalization of the platform companies, right, then here you have the situation in the US. So size is size. 
This is the situation. I mean, this was one and a half years ago, but it hasn't changed dramatically since. So this is Asia, right? There's one, um, Samsung is from Korea. I don't see a Japanese company. This is Europe, right? So in terms of market capitalization for the, for the, uh, for the platforms, Europe is 3% worldwide, right? What a shame. Africa has two with just one company, right? Yeah, that's the situation. And that despite the fact that if you look at AI patent applications, right, the red, the red ones are Japanese companies. So one, two, three, four, six out of 10 are Japanese, and there's no Japanese company in that area that is really, you know, world leading. Question is why? Maybe it's because, as Rodney said, you know, realization is four times four orders of magnitude away from patent application, right? So I'm not saying you should give up on this. It's just, you know, obviously there is this, this gap of translation from the lab to the market, right? So this is what we should be aware of. So in, in, in Europe, we have obviously two problems. We have almost no patent application, which is not quite true, because if you look at, for example, at autonomous driving, Bosch is the leading company worldwide, but, um, but the numbers are much smaller than for these companies. Right? Um, so something needs to be done in Europe. Right? So there are, in Europe, we are very good at talking and very bad at implementing. I mean, we really have to, we really have to admit that. Right? So we have a number of programs. We started cognitive robotics in, uh, well, more than 20 years ago. There have been a number of very interesting uh, big projects, substantial investment into cognitive robotics, very nice lab demos. Right? Rodney will probably agree with this. But hardly anything has ever appeared in the market. Right? Um, so we have, you know, this has throughout uh, FP8, Horizon 2020, and now next will be Horizon Europe. Um, this has robotics, automation, AI have played a major role, but of course you can, you can really doubt whether that money was well invested. Nevertheless, the Commission has now published a proposal for Horizon Europe, and 100 billion um, euros will be spent uh, on research um, in the next framework program, which will be between 2021 and 2026. So there is a lot of you know, capital and resources available. The question is, what do we do with it? Now, um, this discussion about moonshots and in particular um, the, the question, what is realistic? How can we turn that money into products that help people? We have already had in Europe. And the result is basically this. You may find this trivial, but, um, but nevertheless, I mean, it's been the, uh, the result of a, large, a long discussion process, very democratic, by the way, right? So all the researchers were requested and were consulted, requested to, to comment. This is the outcome for the area of robotics, right? So we will invest in healthcare, agriculture and food, maintenance and inspection of infrastructure, agile production, right? Now this will have, a lot of, will have a lot to do with AI and based on AI, but the, uh, the purpose here is really to, um, well, to produce stuff that works and that will keep Europe uh, competitive. So healthcare, right, just those four. Healthcare um, is a very broad thing, I mean health, the health market in, in Europe is about the same size as the automobile market, right? So investing here is, you know, it can be tedious, it can be long-term, you need all these clinical studies and stuff. There have been lots of uh, surgical robots. There's been only one really successful, which is, of course, from the US, intuitive surgical. But we will invest heavily in this area. And, uh, I mean, we have good lab, de lab demos, but... Um, but not really very good products, but we have a very strong industry in the health sector in, in, um, in Europe, so that will, so we can, we can uh, hope for good results. 
Next is agri-food. Obviously, we need to feed the um, we need to feed the um, the growing population on on this planet, right? Everybody knows that. Question is, how do we do this most effectively, most efficiently? So this will be another area for you know for robotics, and there have been lots of you know robots, autonomous harvesters and stuff like that out in the market already. This will be another focus of investment in Europe. Maintenance of critical infrastructures, that I think is also clear. Rodney mentioned the uh, Fukushima plant, but uh, if you look at you know, all kinds of uh, power stations, power lines, uh, any kind of you know, inaccessible or uh, hazardous environments, robots will definitely um, make it possible for us to service them better and to protect them better. So this is the third sector. And then, of course, production, right? We, uh, I think we can, it's fair to say that in Europe we have, you know, very, very good production, you know, uh, industries that produce stuff that enables other people, other nations to produce, right? Even Rodney's company was acquired by a German company. Germany has a higher robot density than Japan much higher actually per 10,000 workers, which is very surprising because in the 70s and the 80s it, 80s it was really the other way around, right? So we're investing heavily. But, you know, it's, it's of not much use because, you know, German companies, European companies want to increase productivity and their, their earnings by 5%, 10%. American companies, startups, platform business want to triple their revenue, right? So this is a completely different, completely different approach from, um, from Europe. Okay, so robots needs AI, um, or robotics needs AI, and I, AI needs robots. That's maybe the motto and the slogan that was circulated in the European Parliament. So this is uh, somehow the guideline. Embodied AI, term coined by Rodney, so many, many years ago has made its way into the mainstream, and even the European Parliament uh, has now adopted it. So AI and robotics are seen as one thing, right? So, but nevertheless, the, you know, the European touch is that safety, ethical, and legal constraints are never compromised. And that, of course, constrains us a lot. On the other hand, it may lead to products that uh, are really safe, right? Not like the Waymo vehicle that you saw a couple of minutes ago. And this is maybe something that is, uh, that's very special to Europe, as you may know, also to Japan. I mean, would, uh, would you expect a Toyota to crash? Never. Never. In America, well, we are a bit more tolerant. No? no? He's a bit more crazy, okay. <laughs> Musk is more crazy. A bit crazy, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, to give you an impression about what is going on in AI and robotics, here's a, uh, here's a, a chart of the individual member states, right? So this breaks down the um, uh, computer vision and natural languaging process, uh, 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 projects, machine learning and deep learning and robotics, right? And you can see that robotics in almost, this is the UK, almost all member states is by far um, the biggest number. Right. Only Austria, oops, sorry, only Austria is the, um, uh, is, or here Hungary, where uh, computer vision and natural language processing um, is prioritized over uh, robotics. Right. And these are major, uh, I like to show this graph because it shows, you know, this is Munich, and um, in Munich, the human resources in science and technology and percentage share of the economically active population is the highest, right? So come to Munich or go to Scotland, here, somewhere. Okay, right, so what, what, is, what will happen? What will happen next in uh, Europe? Well, there are a number of activities um, already um, in the pipeline. Right, so we will invest um, about one and a half billion euros in AI into AI in 20, 2018 to 2020. So that's actually going on; it's already happening. Basic industri basic and industrial research, AI on demand platform, which is something that is now being built up, a network of AI-focused digital innovation hubs, 
DIH, or very European, you know, very European speak, digital innovation hubs, strengthening AI excellence, right? and um, setting up an industry data platform for providing the data that might be uh, useful for training systems, for learning systems, or to train learnable systems, whatever you want to call it. So this is the uh, AI for EU. This will be, uh, as I said, is being set up. It will be available to everyone. Everyone can use the stuff there, so it's all open, right? And um, yeah, it's on the order of 20 million euros. Um, it's now starting and it will, it will last until at least 2027, right? So at least uh, 10, about 10 years, so about the, uh, the duration that you're discussing for the moonshot. And here are the action lines, but uh, this is more technical stuff, right? So this is the timeline, right? So we are now somewhere here. And there will be a lot of money made available for these individual action lines. Um, I can tell you that uh, the, the, the Commission is very keen on European and Japanese, Europe, Jap Europe and Japan cooperation. So this is something that uh, if you have a good idea, then let's talk. Right. Maybe we can also synchronize somehow the Moonshot uh, program with, you know, with the ECD programs. Um, in order to you know, increase the number of interesting companies and market capitalization of stuff that's going on in this area, right? So this maybe I skip. This is you know, what we want to achieve. We want to strengthen the demand, unlock investment. This is, you know, this is the usual business talk, but nevertheless, we have those 10 um, mantras and, um, and, they will, and the commission will follow them. If you want to read further, there are as I said before, there's a lot of literature, what should be done. Now let's see whether we get it going. Right, that's an open question. Maybe five examples of what we have, what, what uh, is, um, well, it's not really special to Europe, but maybe you're not aware of the fact that there are, apart from the Roomba, there are also other AI-powered uh, robots. For example, Miro. Miro is a, uh, is a pet-like thing, but it acts maybe more intelligently than others because it was developed in part by researchers who are also in the HPP, in the Human Brain Project, Sheffield. There is uh, this one, the ExoTrainer, for, you know, for helping uh, children with disabilities. It's also in the market. You can buy it, and there are therapies um, uh, that, that are uh, adapted to the capabilities of this robot. The Kilobot, Right, which is a very interesting thing from Switzerland, where you have these little legs that are, um, uh, that are powered by, you know, what you have in your smartphone, these um, vibration units, and, and you buy them by the dozen or by the hundreds, and then they, you know, perform some kind of swarm um, intelligence, uh, whatever you want to do with this. And then, of course, there is this one, right, uh, this one was, is also a European project developed by Aldebaran Robotics, which was uh, acquired, as you know, by SoftBank a couple of years ago. But it was developed by Bruno Massonnier and his Aldebaran company. You may judge whether it's a useful. Who has, is there any opinion? Is that useful? Who has seen one? Yeah. Is it useful? Yeah, so only for professors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. What? Well, yes, Rodney. He has a special view on the pepper, I would say. What? Just say that um, about two or three years ago, I was walking around Tokyo Station, and lots and lots of stores were getting peppers delivered. Yes. Yeah. And three months later, I came, and I went and used some of the peppers and they're all gone now. They're all gone now, yeah. yeah. And why is that? I'm just reporting facts. No, no, uh, no, no. No, it's true. I mean, same, same, same in, in Europe. Uh, one of the reasons is because, probably because it is, you know, very, very predictable what the thing is doing. So there's no surprise. There is nothing that you would not expect it to do. And then, of course, the, you know, the behavior 
and, and the then manipulation capabilities are very restricted. Right. But nevertheless, it was a nice, uh, nice development. And this is maybe the, uh, an interesting, you know, bio-inspired um, robot by Festo. And this one I like in particular because this one, right, um, is, you know, there's almost no computation. There's almost this no electronics, almost no electronics, right? And it can fly. So this is a, a very nice uh, example of, you know, embodiment and, uh, and uh, morphological computation. So everything that's done in this thing is done by the body, by the material, and very little computation is taking place while it is flying, right? Okay, so let me give you two examples of projects that we have done in Europe. One is the, um, one is the, um, uh, it's called Proto Future. Um, and the other one is, of course, the Human Brain Project, which I will uh, elaborate on a little bit uh, further. Is this the time that I have already used up? Wow, maybe I should speed up a bit. So Proto Future is, the, is a, a project which was built on the hypothesis that all products in the future will be cognitive. So at least there will be a perception component, some cognitive uh, processing, and then an action component. Perception, cognition, and action. Right? And here are examples for this. You may now say, okay, well, we might say another hype, cognition. But, well, I mean, if you look at it, there is a lot of sensing, there is a lot of processing, and then uh, decision making. Maybe not, uh, you know, on the level that uh, Rodney was referring to as be really in intelligent, but at least for performing a certain action or per performing a certain task, right? So this is, this is the cognitive abilities that these people that, uh, or actually I'm also part of the project, that we, are, that we are aiming at, right? And here you can see what the individual, you know, uh, stages of this project are. So industry for zero is something that is taken for granted, even though in, in real plans it's not yet taken, uh, uh, it's not yet really, uh, you know, fully up to speed. We take this as granted. The question is, what is the next step, right? So machines that will perceive, machines that will be may, may have some kind of very limited self-awareness, and that would then be able to reason and act, maybe work together, right? So cognitive products on the, on the one hand and cognitive production on the other, on the other hand is, is definitely something that is, you know, coming up and where we will invest more, where we will see much more investment in Europe. And this is a project that is actually already going very much in that direction. As you can see, everything, every buzzword that you could think of is in this project, yeah. But, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, that really, you know, useful things already coming out of it. One thing that you would probably not, um, Think of being a uh, you know a target of a target of uh, cogn of cognition is this screwdriver, right? But if you think of it, or if you think about it, well, there are lots of you know um, lots of uh, parameters that determine the operation of such a screwdriver that can be sensed, and where you can then adapt the behavior uh, according to what you're sensing, right? So a simple product in enhanced by a lot of uh, sensing, feedback, et cetera. Right, so, and there are quite a few others that, uh, that we're developing here. Uh, this is just a simple example. But again, of course, this is not a product yet. Right. Could become a product, probably made in China. So developed in Europe, made in China, and the profit go to China. OK, now the Human Brain Project. I have not much time left, but let me still say, what, what is the Human Brain uh, Flagship Project? Well, it's about, uh, you know, simulating at least parts of the brain, right? I would consider it from my personal point of view now, after we have been working on it for many, many years, actually since 2009, when we started the, the, this concept of uh, European flagships, I would rather call it a project for the virtualization of neuroscience, which is, of course, something that, you know, neuroscientists don't like to hear because they think 
well, if they virtualize neuroscience and everything happens in the computer, what am I good for? Right? And they're extremely conservative, extremely conservative. They want to do, they want to continue doing what they've always done. So that's another reason why this project is so uh, controversial. Right? So even though the brain contains almost as many individual structures, is less observable and more complex than the universe, than the universe brain research is still mainly based on traditional experiments in the lab, wet science, right? And we think this is, you know, really, uh, is now really time to overcome this situation. Right? So the vision, or my vision would be, right, following Richard Feynman, Feynman, what I cannot create, I cannot, I do not understand. So if you want to understand the brain, I mean, let's create one. Let's build one. Sounds simple, and of course, it's completely unrealistic, but maybe we can take at least a step in that direction. Right? So what we need for this is um, you know, a large-scale interdisciplinary integrating infrastructure for performing holistic multi-level studies of brain and body, blah, 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 in order to design new brain-derived computer architectures and robots. So maybe the work here will help us you know, to really come up with stuff that's more um, intelligent than what we have at the moment. Right? So we want to create and operate collaborative research tools. It's also very important that you know we can't do it all alone. It is about collaboration. It is about working together um, for experimental and virtualized brain research and developing brain-derived technologies. Now I, I think I have to skip this. Uh, this is a bit of uh, history. Um, well, suffice it to say that, you know, uh, this was, we started this in 2009, and then there was a, uh, very much like the moonshot, right? So we, we came up with, the, you know, a, a call for tender, or the EU came up with a call for tender, 23 proposals, not 25 moonshot um, candidates. Uh, so 23 proposals were submitted, and then these came out of that process. Right, knowledge acceleration, crisis relief system, guardian angels, that's zero power devices, uh, IT future of medicine, robot companions for citizens. Th these were the pilots, those six, and then two were selected. One is graphene, and the other one, the human brain project. Right? And each uh, were promised a funding of one billion euros. Well, of course, this was not so far we have uh, secured funding on the order of 500 million, so half a billion, but it depends on how we go, whether there will be additional contributions from the member states or not. So here's the, this is the timeline of the project. So we started in uh, 2012 with the pilot ramp up phase and the operational phase. 2023, the project will end. And then um, we are now establishing what is called a European, or trying to establish rather, a European research infrastructure so that the project and the, the, the work in the project, the work on brain research in that direction can live on ideally forever. But of course it's a question of funding. And as you know, funding is hard. Getting funding is hard, right? So here, so, so when you have a project like this, how do you structure it? How do you, how do you put it together so that you, know, you have at least a, a chance of uh, doing what, or, or coming up with, with results that are tangible and where you know, taxpayers will say in the end, wow, now I see why I pay so high taxes because of these results. Right? So the original structure was accelerated neuroscience is to integrate everything we know about the brain. So this is about data, data curation, everything that is known into a unified picture that everybody can then access, accelerated medicine. Maybe we can you know, learn something about um, brain diseases. So uh, Henry always comes up with this figure, you know, like um, brain diseases cause um, damages or uh, uh, you know, an amount of, of, uh, of loss in economic figures on the order of $800 billion per year. So if we can at least come up with a little bit of relief there, or we can postpone um, the outbreak of, uh, of um, brain diseases in, in, in individual people, then there is a, a, a huge economic 
uh, leverage to be expected. Right? And accelerated future computing, learn from the brain how to build robots and computers of tomorrow. So, for example, if we have, you know, unlimited computer power and, and you know, millions and millions of uh, processing units, how do we structure it? How we can put them to useful, to useful use? Well, that's not, not a trivial task, but maybe we can learn a little bit from the brain how to structure things. Right? So that's the, uh, that is the structure of the project. So we uh, have like, you know, 10 sub-projects from mouse brain organization, human brain system, theoretical neuroscience, and then, on, so this is the neuroscience part, this is the ICT platforms, everything here is in principle available to everyone, right? All the results are available on the web, so everybody's invited to use them as they, pack, as they become available. Oops, sorry, neuro, neuro, neuroinformatics, Brain simulation, of course, particularly important. Um, HPC, medical informatics, and neuromorphic computing platform. I am personally responsible for the um, for the neurorobotics platform. And um, and this is what I would like to uh, come to in a second. But before that, here you can see some key data of the project. So this is at the moment uh, the uh, the status. We have 121 partners, seven partnering projects in you know all across Europe. Estimated funding is 406 until 2023, probably a little bit more, and we already have quite a number of platform users. Interestingly enough, most of the platform users are from China, um, not surprisingly. Right, so here you can see, this was actually, this, was, this is a simulation of a microcircuit. This was at the beginning of the, uh, of the HPP, uh, so this is a, um, a simulation of a cortical column, 70,000 neurons, 70,000 neurons, right? And this is about, th th this is down to the molecular level, all the action potentials, everything that we know about that structure is simulated on, a, uh, on an IBM supercomputer, the, um, the Blue Gene supercomputer. This was published in 2009, so already 10 years ago, just before the start of the HPP. Uh, this is about, I think, uh, 10 seconds. Uh, real time took about a week to compute. Right. And there are other very nice simulations. You can access them also on YouTube. Right? So, but what's the use of a brain without a body? No brain exists without a body, unless anybody proves me wrong. I would not be aware, well, could be in principle, but has not been observed so far. Right, so neurobotics has been, you know, an integral part of this project from the very start, right, from the very beginning. This is, um, you know, a robot that uh, Rob Pfeiffer and myself designed many years ago, also like 10 years ago, very realistic. Um, it's now in my lab. Uh, we have continued developing it. Uh, it's very, you know, very bio-inspired, has a similar dynamics with, you know, uh, humans. And the hope would be that once we have such a body, integrate a brain into it, maybe we can observe some behavior that is similar to ours, or some intelligence that's similar to ours. Right? So neurobotics, at the heart of neurobotics is really controlling robots by mimicking what we know about the nervous system of uh, biological creatures as closely as possible and as accurately as possible. Right? By the way, uh, the uh, Moonshot Goal 21, if you look it up, goes in a similar direction. Right? It would be a, a, a complete moonshot, moonshot Goal, in my understanding. Here it's just, you know, a sub-project. Sub um, of course, you can now tell whether, uh, whether we are wrong or whether uh, we are maybe too ambitious. Right? So what we really want to do, what we want to do, and what we have partly achieved is, you know, building models of the nervous system um, running them on supercomputers and controlling um, robots, soft robots, with it. Right, so we have built a, the complete, a complete platform, a complete very large software system called the Neurobotics Platform, uh, where we have very realistic uh, uh, models for the robots, physical model, everything that you, including even contact forces and all the, the ugly stuff that roboticists don't like, but it's in there. 
right? Um, we have uh, integrated the HBP tools, for example, the NEST, the neural simulator, which is, the, um, which is a simulator for spiking neural networks with almost unlimited number of, um, of or that can run on an unlimited number of processors, right? And uh, it is all very open and extensible. So there are uh, a large number of tools with which you can define experiments in the neuro, for, for neural robots, you can run them all in simulation or partly even, uh, so if you have simulated something, you can print out the robot and then you can program the robot based on the simulation. Right. Two examples. Right. So what can neurobotics do for the virtualization of brain research? Well, first, as I said, we need a, we need a model. So we built a model of a mouse, right, including, sorry, including everything that, uh, you know, determines its behavior. So we have a brain model here, and the spinal cord model, and a body model. Yeah. Took us uh, a couple of years to design that, uh, but now we think it's, we have a very realistic model with which we can do uh, quite a bit of interesting stuff, right? For example, so this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a rendering of a small experiment that we've done. So this is a mouse. This is actually a real experiment that the neuroscientists do and that the neuroscientists say, if we can really do this in the computer, it would be useful. Only very few of the neuroscientists, right? Just the more uh, innovative ones. The other ones say, this is ab absolutely no use. What, I mean, what can I learn from this? This is bullshit. But others say, well, maybe I can learn something from it, right? If I have a, a realistic simulation of these individual you know, entities, and then, for example, here I can push the forearm and I can observe the, uh, the uh, here is, this is a model of a, uh, of a, of a microscope. I can, uh, I can model it. I can use a brain model. I can connect the brain model to the, to the body, and then I can see what happens um, in, you know, the um, uh, combination of the two. So we have this, you know, we have our uh, body. This is, a, this is our simulated mouse. Of course, then we have a, uh, you know, a skeleton model, and we've even printed it out. Of course, the, uh, you know, the motion and the, uh, and the behavior of that printed mouse are vastly, are very much different from what you would see in a real mouse, but, you know, it's better than nothing. And this is actually the smallest four-legged robot uh, in the world, at least to the best of our knowledge, right? So here you see, um, here you see the, uh, the real experiment with a real mouse, right? So here you have a, uh, a, uh, a microscope that looks into the brain, and here you see the simulated, the simulated experiment, and you can observe what happens in the brain of that mouse, of that simulated mouse. So what in the end we would like to do is, or we are actually already doing, is closed loop simulations, closed loop neuroscience, so we observe what is going on, you know, in the simulated model, and then of course we try to calibrate the model with the real world. So in effect we have two uh, closed loop systems here. One is um, in the at runtime, right? At runtime, we look at the um, we look at the uh, the uh, uh, the system, simulated and real, right? And the the uh, what happens is we change the environment. You know, everything goes through the sensors, the modeled sensors, the modeled brain, and results in an action. And when we do this, we do the same with the the real mouse, right? Or the real um, um, the real organism, and then we calibrate it such that for at least the, uh, you know, the, the important uh, aspects, the whole thing, or, or both um, are um, uh, in line, right? So that uh, in the end, you know, if you, and this is something that we are not promising, but, uh, but if, you, if you continue that, or thinking along these lines, then maybe in the end, you can do away with a number of uh, animal experiments that nobody really likes. Right? The other thing is, so, so this is a, uh, another experiment where you have a mouse, right, which is reaching for these pellets, eats them, and, the, um, and our goal is to simulate this as well, including, you know, all the, um, uh, the instincts that the mouse 
uh, needs to do that. So this is, this is, the, um, this is our vision, to, to have dynamic virtual closed loop neuroscience in the computer, right? And in the end, we can also, if that works, right, we can also come or move from static atlases of the brain to dynamic ones, right? So you put, a, uh, you put a, uh, uh, an animal into, you know, you put an animal into this, um, this setup, right? If you look at the brain structure, it, the animal performs something, and then you look what happens in the brain. What, what will a certain stimulus in the environment lead to in the brain? Right? Nobody can do that so far. And, but this is only something that uh, you know, may come out of our research if we get the, the uh, necessary funding, of course. It's always a question of funding. Right, and the second example is um, virtual closed loop systems for embodied learning. Right, so what we've done here uh, is we looked at, you know, this is an experiment by Google that you may have seen a couple of years ago, 2017, right, where um, these robots work in parallel. They have sensors here, connect sensors, and they learn how to grasp. So in the beginning, they know nothing, and then, you know, they keep grasping, grasping, grasping. Of course, there has to be some kind of, you know, success function. Here's the uh, view of the lab, right? So it took them, they have up to 14 robots operating in parallel, two months runtime, 800,000 grasp attempts, and then in the end, the robots were completely worn out. Right? So they threw them away. Not German robots, obviously. Now they're doing it with KUKA lightweight robots, the second version of the experiment. But that's not important. What we did, we copied this, right? So we copied this into the neurobotics platform, right? Using the same models that, uh, or the same learning models, the same uh, neural structures that, uh, that Google are using, right? Um, highly realistic, at least as far as the learning task is concerned, right? And, um, yeah, and we completely replace this physical setup, right? Um, of course, there are other platforms that, with which you could do this in principle, but ours is the only one where you can really integrate everything and uh, where, um, where, where you don't depend on you know, a certain vendor, a certain um, provider of these tools, right? So we claim that the NRP in that sense is setting the standard for virtual neural robotics, Right, we have, you know, we support, uh, I mean, this is not a commercial, don't get me wrong, but, um, but we, we've, we've really spent a lot of time in, you know, on integrating, bringing together all these, uh, this standard stuff, including neuromorphic hardware. I did not comment on this, but there's also a sub-project on neuromorphic hardware in the Human Brain Project. We're using the Intel neuromorphic hardware, Intel Luigi, right, which you can, which we use to control the, um, the, uh, the simulated robot, right? And then, um, this is a short video, which will take me almost to the end, um, where you can see how this, um, how this uh, in principle works. So the essence is now that we have put all this into the computer, that we can now really simulate this, we are not limited by the number of physical robots. We can have as many as we want. So here we have, we have the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, like I showed you, the, um, the Google experiment, as we call it, the Google robot exper learning experiment, and, and, the, um, and the corresponding experiment in the neural robotics platform, right? And, and as you can see, in just a second, or just a few seconds, we can have 100 robots doing this in parallel. So these robots also in the original uh, experiment inform each other about what they have learned, right? So things, are, or the learning progress increases exponentially if you do it right, right? So here you can see the models. It's, it is relatively, you know, some of the stuff is, we are limited by the performance of Gazebo and these open source uh, tools. So it's, this, is not, this is not a study in, um, in computer games. This is a study in physical uh, fidelity, right? 
So we can learn uh, on a single object, right, like this. It's very much like in the, uh, you know, in the real world. It tries and tries and tries. It fails, it fails, it fails. But then it becomes better and better, right? And then in the, in the final step or in step four, we can, you know, we just replicate these robots. We can have, I think we now have like 150, and they all operate in parallel. Right? And we can therefore, uh, in principle, increase the speed of learning, increase the adaptation capability, if you will, by orders of magnitude. Okay, so to sum it up, neurorobotics platform has two purposes. On the one hand, it is uh, to, you know, to uh, improve robotics, to bring neurorobotics maybe to the mainstream, um, embodied AI. So uh, robotics receives brain-derived robotics, models and, and all of this. But we can also, we, we hope, I mean, as roboticists, of course, we can also define our own goals, but we hope to receive, you know, input from the robotics community so that we have new requirements for robots, new requirements for AI that we can then integrate into the platform. By the same token, we can say, okay, um, let us learn from, you know, the rest of the HPP. What are, what are outcomes of the... Um, what are outcomes of uh, the, the neuroscientists, the, uh, the uh, neuro research, brain research, cognition, neurotechnology? How can we integrate that into the platform? And then, you know, do closed loop experiments for the neuroscientists, at least for those who are open to um, work with a computer system instead of a, you know, a wet lab. So everybody is um, invited to join, right? We have very nice. Uh, very nice uh, graphical renderings. Um, and yeah, so that's the, uh, basically the, uh, the summary in three words. The HPP has a very broad scope, right? From fundamental research to technology applications, not the market, not the market. It's only about lab demos, right? One central element is the construction of digital twin of the nervous system, CU Moonshot Goal 21. In my understanding, very similar. Maybe there is some collaboration potential. The ultimate goal is simulation of essential parts of the body-brain relationship in order to learn from biology, right? But also, you know, to, um, to help the biologists and the neuroscientists to come up with new ideas. So maybe we should know, we should not only uh, go to the moon but in that sense, reach for the stars. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, very interesting talk. And uh, I think uh, neural robotics is uh, one of the example of a uh, moonshot. And uh, uh, Professor, uh, 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 sorry, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Brooks uh, talked about the uh, uh, criterion of success. Yes. And uh, uh, how, what is uh, your definition of success in which year of a new robotics? And uh, another question is uh, you talked about the technology and the profit. Yes. And uh, uh, I think a European project is very smart every time. And uh, you are thinking about the uh, ecosystem, including uh, standards. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, uh, new robotics also uh, may be thinking about uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, if you have a, uh, uh, you can explain, uh, please. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so maybe the first question, uh, the, the second question first. Uh, of course, if you don't design an ecosystem around the, this, this stuff, then what will happen is everything we, you know, come up with goes to China. That's the, I mean, that's really the experience that we have made in many, you know, in many cases. Oh, right? but, uh, so, so it is very important that, you know, we have startups, education, um, the, the, you know, the, the research, but also uh, users, right, that are open to, you know, use it like, you know, the, uh, the Roomba is a very good example. All these other robots that I showed, some of them are quite successful indeed. So that's very important to close the loop from, you know, from the idea to the market and then also accept what the market says. Right? But, um, yeah. but Rodney once told us that, or said that, you know, it took him 18 years of, how long? 11 years from the concept to the first uh, release of the first Pumba. Around about 11 years, 10 years, right? So, so this is, you know, it, 
This cannot be a criterion for success because it, in the case of these systems, which are much, much more complicated, much more complex, it will take even longer, right? Yeah. And so the question for the, you know, for the success criteria, I mean, we are open to define them. Is it, pos is it enough to simulate a brain with 10 neurons and then say, okay, we have captured every, every aspect of it? Would you accept that? Or would you say maybe I need, you know, in order to generate uh, sensible behavior, I need like 10,000 neurons, but then of course I cannot uh, simulate them down to the molecular level. So the question is really what what is the expectation level, and and then I can define it. And then of course it's it's relatively easy to say we have achieved it or not. Of course the public will. It, this is nothing like you know somebody sending to the moon and 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 then say okay, oh, hey, he came back alive. This is a lot more complicated to explain. And that's the problem. Okay, so thank you very much. But, but maybe we can also, uh, you know, if you have an idea for a robot that depends on, you know, this kind of intelligence to perform, then that would also be a you know, criterion of, of success. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, uh, about that, uh, your European projects like uh, automotive, uh, automotive uh, defined uh, operating system and uh, hardware standard and uh, uh, big benefit, uh, profit to Europe. Maybe yeah. uh, you can think about that kind of in Europe. You mean auto science stuff like that? Yeah. 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 Of course. I mean, if we can, if we can come up with a standard. But I mean, who likes to define standards? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, any other questions? Ah, please. Question? Oh, be careful, this won't be long enough. <laughs> so, earlier in your talk about the uh, EU activities, yeah. you mentioned the uh, AI on-demand platform. Yes. I don't, I don't want to know what the on-demand here means. Well, it means that when, when you have a certain, I mean, that's at least the plan, right? If you, if you are, let's say, a, a factory owner or you operate a plant, and you see there is a need for, you know, possibly an, an AI component, you can then get it from that platform. Maybe there are also experts that, that help you implement it or that help you install it. So that's the on-demand. So whatever is needed will be provided if it is, you know, can be made available. Okay? Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, oh, please. Us there. Thank you very much for a nice talk. So the, in OECD or say IEEE, there are sort of, uh, let's say the guidelines are published now. So do you have any other idea, any say idea regarding uh, development, technology development guideline to make a good relationship to the AI and the robot, robot? Say. Well, I mean, as far as, as far as I know, there are a number of uh, technical working groups in the, uh, in the uh, uh, in the IEEE, yeah. one of which was one, one of which I'm actually a member of, which is the uh, which is the working group on uh, cyborgs and bionic systems (CBS), started by uh, Toshi. Um, but of course, it would be easily possible to to set not easily, but it would be possible <laughs> to set to set up one in that area as well. Mm. Right. So if you want to join us, then please, you're welcome. Let's uh, start a working group in the IEEE. But I tell you, it's a lot of work and, you know, very little reward. Yeah, in, a, in a IEC, we also have some sort of the activity to make a good guideline yeah. for the standardization of this kind of activity. Yeah. But I, in my knowledge, there is not, say, a good uh, relationship to the AI community and the robot community so far. Yeah. But according to your nice presentation, the AI and the robots say, autonomously <laughs> have a good relationship in no. the future. Yeah, so right. this means that we need a sort of the guideline to make a good relationship. So that's my well, uh, I mean, idea coming from your presentation. Yeah, what I have already suggested to the IEEE is, is to, to really to start a new conference series on this yeah. in parallel with the working group, right? And, and, and so, so to get things going, because at the moment there is really a gap in the IEEE. Right? I mean, you have the IROS and the, uh, the ICRA and all this. But, but this is not really represented. Okay. Right? Yeah. It is actually, well, but, but even, you know, starting a conference series is today a lot more complicated. I started the Humanoids uh, conference series in the in IEEE in 2000. It was very easy. 
It was very easy. Now it is a complex process. Okay. But I mean, if, if we get support, we can do it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, we, we have the name of ITP. I should explain one thing. Uh, Toshi Fukuda will be a president of ITP. ITP have a world largest academic organization. We have uh, 420,000 members. And uh, today uh, he had a, a very important ceremony, uh, ITP milestone awards uh, ceremony in Japan. And uh, he went to the <laughs> award ceremony. And uh, he will return at uh, one o'clock. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And uh, so, uh, Myself is uh, not a specialist in uh, robotics. I'm a president of ITP Computer Society. So uh, from a computation uh, view, uh, I'm uh, uh, giving an opinion in this project. And uh, I'm very familiar about the supercomputing, yeah. parallel distributed computing. Uh, anyway, so uh, do you have any other questions or comments? OK. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Kno. So uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, uh, Brooks and uh, Professor Kno. Uh, next session will start at 1 o'clock from here. So uh, please take a break. Thank you very much. <laughs>